Last year on the channel, I had the opportunity to review the GamerStorm Deepcool Castle 240 RGB, a 240 millimeter AIO liquid cooler. It was one of the more well-received and most asked about cooler reviews I've ever done on this channel. But unfortunately, most of you couldn't buy one as it was not available in the US. Well, this year I'm very happy to say, enter the Deepcool Castle 240 EX, and this one you can actually buy. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Like I said, today we're gonna to take a look at the all new GamerStorm Deepcool Castle 240EX, a 240 millimeter AIO liquid cooler that I first saw at CES earlier this year. Just about the only thing that hasn't changed on this since the previous generation is the name. It's still called the Castle 240. Just about every physical aspect of it has gone through some development throughout the year though. The pump top is still very much the focal point of this cooler with that infinity mirror rainbow design that a lot of you liked so very much. The previous castle also included two addressable RGB fans, whereas this one only includes a set of black fans. However, the radiator has probably gone through the most radical change of all. The radiator has what Deepcool is calling their anti-leak technology. It is an internal bladder that essentially adjusts to pressure changes inside of the AIO, meaning that it actually releases air and expands the volume inside the radiator to prevent leaks from pressure building up. Unboxing the Deepcool Castle EX is pretty much standard fare for an AIO. However, Deepcool always includes a couple extra accessories and this is no difference here. Inside of here, we do have an RGB controller as well as an RGB splitter. So you could actually expand this into some addressable RGB fans. And uh, it looks like we have at least three leads off of this, which would be very similar to the last model. Very cool to see expansion in mind when you buy products. Inside of the big bag is all of our mounting hardware for pretty much every socket except for Threadripper. And then there's this little guy which is brand new for this model. This is actually a printable replaceable internal disc that you can uh, replace the Deepcool GamerStorm logo inside of the pump top, meaning you can put whatever logo you want inside of that infinity mirror. And that is a cool touch. Obviously being a 240 millimeter radiator means it's going to include a pair of 120 millimeter fans. And these ones are the GamerStorm TF120S series fans. I really do like the look of these. They have kind of that triangle design that GamerStorm has been incorporating on more and more of their products. It's a really sharp look. Testing for today, we're going to install the 240EX into the iBuyPower Snowblind system I have behind me. And we're gonna compare it to the results that I get from the built-in Asetek that came with it. It has a 9900K and should pose a pretty decent test for this cooler. We're gonna test at stock speeds and if there's any headroom left available, I will try to dial in an overclock. So let's get to it. A montage, a much needed haircut, and a brand new beer later, and uh, we're ready to talk about this thing. Installation wise, the Captain 240EX went in just as easily as I hoped it would. A lot of modern AIOs have really simplified the mounting mechanism, and that is a surefire way to lose points for me if your mounting is overcomplicated. In this case, there was just a back plate that was very clearly labeled with a couple of screws poking through, and then you attach the AIO and tighten it down with a set of nuts on top. Very, very simple. The tubing has a very nice braided cover on top of it and is actually quite rigid. It was uh, a little bit difficult to bend into the right orientation. And in fact, at one point I lost handle on the radiator itself and it went flying across the case. Uh, no damage was done, but uh, it'll go where you want it to go, but it will take a little bit of encouragement to get it there. I do have one complaint about the overall installation and that's actually the length of the included screws. I have a push configuration set up on the front of my case, which means the screw goes through the front panel first and then through the fan, and then finally into the radiator where it kind of holds everything together. The metal on the front of my case is not very thick and the screws had a hard time getting all the way through the fans, let alone into the first couple of threads of the radiator. I did have to squeeze pretty hard on the back of the radiator, plus putting a little bit of body weight into the screwdriver in order to get the screws to bite into the threads. Not the biggest deal in the world and pretty easily overcome, but it was a difficulty I didn't anticipate and something you'll wanna keep in mind if you plan on running a radiator in this configuration. 
Looks-wise, the Castle 240 is one of my favorite AIOs to come out in a number of years, and the 240EX improves on that design, with the RGB peeking out from behind the CPU block while retaining that infinity mirror rainbow look. I'm pretty sure I talked about this in the intro, but I am disappointed with the decision not to include addressable RGB fans with this kit, unlike the original Captain. They gave a real distinct look on top of the Infinity Mirror, and having just black fans, it feels like something's just a little bit missing, especially when my fans are front and center in this case. I'm not sure if that was a cost-saving measure, swapping the addressable RGB fans for the anti-leak technology that's inside of the radiator now, which only time will tell if that was a worthwhile decision. However, on the surface, I am missing that little bit of bling on the front. The other improvement on the pump is the GamerStorm logo is now rotatable and replaceable if you want to swap it out with something else. Simply reach in there, give a little 1 8 turn to the top of the pump, and this little top panel pops right off. The GamerStorm logo can then be removed, replaced with your own design, and rotated as needed if you have your pump in a different orientation. On to performance testing. I did say in the intro I'd be comparing the Captain 240EX to the Asetek Design I buy power radiator that came in my Snowblind case. However, on further inspection, this is not an Asetek Design radiator. Uh, I know that because the pump is not in the CPU head right here. It's actually in the radiator itself, bolted all the way through. A very interesting design that I've never seen before. So keep that in mind, this is not actually an Asetek radiator, but we're gonna compare against it anyway. All of our performance testing was done today inside of Cinebench R20 with Hardware Info 64 keeping track of our temperature data. The multi-threading test was run ad nauseum until we got three identical high temperature results in a row. So how did our iBuyPower 240mm radiator do? At idle it sat at 28 degrees Celsius, which is about what I would expect given the ambient temperature in the room. However, under full Cinebench load, it peaked at 90 degrees Celsius, which is way hotter than I would expect it to, given that we were on a stock frequency 9900K at just 4.7 gigahertz all core boost. Under a gaming load, that number is certainly going to come down, but for any kind of content professional or if you're doing AVX workloads or encoding, 90 degrees is a little bit too warm for my taste. Given that we were already hitting 90 degrees under stock frequencies, I decided not to give overclocking a go on the iBuy Power Kit. However, how did the Captain 240EX fare? Surprisingly well. When I tested the Captain, the ambient temperature in the room had risen about 2 degrees Celsius, so keep that in mind when looking at these results. Idle temperatures had risen to about 30 degrees, so we're going to call that even since it's only a 2 degree delta between the two, and the ambient temperature is now 2 degrees different. However, under full load inside of Cinebench, we only reached a max of 84 degrees Celsius. And if my math is correct, that's an 8 degree delta improvement over the iBuyPower 240 mil, so fantastic results thus far. Given that I had a little bit of headroom left to play with, I opted to do a light overclock on our 9900K, up to a 4.9 GHz all-core boost. And I wish I didn't, as we hit 97 degrees Celsius under full tilt. If I was only doing gaming on this rig, honestly 4.9 GHz would probably be doable on an everyday basis. And in fact, I could probably install an AVX offset to make the frequency lower when an AVX workload is put on the CPU. However, 4.9 GHz is not going to be doable if you throw AVX workloads at your system every single day. That being said, it did perform admirably at 4.7 GHz though, so I'll call that a win in my book. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, the Captain 240X is compatible with pretty much every single motherboard maker's RGB setup, meaning you can integrate the Captain 240EX into your existing RGB ecosystem. The Deepcool GamerStorm Captain 240EX is selling for about $120 on Amazon at the time of this review, and at that price, absolutely gets a recommendation from me. It is a great performing and even better looking all-in-one liquid cooler that, with the right color combination, would look absolutely right at home in just about any system. And that is going to wrap it up for me in this one, but I do have a question for everyone before you go. I mentioned I got a 200 megahertz overclock on my 9900K, which netted me about a 4% performance increase. Is that performance increase worth the extra 13 degrees Celsius that my CPU was running at, or would you rather have your system running cool and quiet and not miss the performance? Let me know down in the comments below. Make sure to like this video if you liked it and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans. And if you like what you see on the screen, consider backing me on Patreon. All of my backers get access to my exclusive Discord server where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from my live show, Talking Heads. As always, thank you all so much for watching this one and I will see you in the next video. Man, that first beer was awful. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Beer for today has some of the coolest can art I have ever come across. It is Level Beer in Portland, Oregon. Let's play. It's a dry hopped Pilsner. Now, typically I am not a huge fan of Pilsners, but I am a fan of hops. So uh, we'll see how this one does.
Well, I'll say this, it certainly looks good on camera. <laughs> It's got a stark white head. Uh, very, very loose pack on the bubbles, though. Those are some really big bubbles that I don't see are gonna last very long on this beer. I don't smell any hops. It smells like bread. So it smells like a Pilsner. Kind of like a skunky pineapple, if I had to call it anything. Like, it's citrus, but it's not a good citrus. So that's what passes for hops these days, huh? I will say, I have had a number of level beers over the years, and uh, they are barn brewed in Portland, Oregon. Uh, the description on this one says, a German-style Pilsner-based beer that uses traditional floral and herbal hops along with citrusy American dry hops. Bright, crisp, refreshing with a pleasant hoppy aroma. Um, there are no hops on the aroma. Uh, I don't taste any, any citrus notes. Uh, I don't taste any American hops in this. I do taste some floralness to this. Um, nothing really herby or, or herbal or earthy though. Um, there's no evolution to it, and like I said, the, the smells I'm getting are a little off-putting. Second drink was a little bit better, but still not great. I don't know about this one. <laughs> I will say, it's a Pilsner. It's not very clear. It's not very crisp. The, the smells are not that great. The flavor is not that great. It's actually kind of a sour, almost skunky-like flavor to it, which is really weird in a Pilsner. Um... I'm not digging this one. I'm not digging this one at all. And yeah, I'm tasting a sourness in here. I, I think this might be a bad can because they're saying zero on the sour scale. I'm definitely getting something sour. I think this might just be a bad batch or a bad can. Uh, that would explain a lot more than uh, me not liking this beer. Cool label, not a very good beer. Let's try again. All right, uh, the last beer that I have from Caveman, it's Earthrider Brewery Caribou Lake India Pale Ale. 7.4%, 84 IBU. Hop aromas of pine and berry harken to lakes of the far north. A prominent malt backbone balances moderate hop bitterness. Hold fast. The bitterness is pushing to, uh, to the, the more enthusiast and extreme levels. It, it's quite bitter, especially on the back end. I'm getting a little bit of maltiness, but it's very muted up front. I think that's because the beer is still pretty much ice cold. Uh, it's probably 35 degrees. Um, we'll let it warm up, see if it develops, but uh, so far I'm digging it. Ooh, there's a little maltiness to it. Ooh, boy, that is turning into something nice. Envy Link Bridge is coming off. There we go. Probably when I drop the radiator. 